good afternoon. Um, so myself and Dave Howell this afternoon will, uh, from Essex Archaeology, will try and uh, take you through the process of data gathering uh, we undertake as archaeologists when um, dealing with offshore development. Um, David will want you to run you through the um, investigation methods and how data is interpreted and managed, and then myself I'll, I'll basically uh, talk you through how we present this data in our um, assessment. Can you all hear me, or is it just me? Is it low? Is it fine? It's good. Okay. Um, wait. So as you can see in the map um, on the right hand side. There's a lot of, um, there's an extensive amount of uh, large infrastructure projects that happen offshore. Um, and a lot of them are, well, most of them are wind farms. There's also aggregate dredging that happens. There's also the development of ports and harbors. Um, we have interconnected cables that uh, lead into other territorial waters, not solely within the UK territorial waters. Um, we have pipelines and tidal schemes. And all these sort of electricity generating devices um, would require a marine license. Um, and generally, obviously, this is uh, taken, um, well, the decision to give a license is taken in accordance with the UK marine uh, policy statement and within Scotland, it would follow the Scottish National Marine Plan. But um, very often these, um, obviously, licenses would require an environment impact assessment to be undertaken and this is where the archaeological um, consultant would come into play. Um, and as, well, a lot, well, at least the bulk of commercial marine archaeology um, is, uh, is, is carried out actually within this offshore developing industry. Um, so as well as you can see a lot of the projects or at least the development is sort of clustered towards the south east coast of England. Um, but apart from, well I think I'm going a bit too fast, but if you, I'll go back to that, if you see this, well you can't really see it. But there is a whole cluster of, oh no, you can't see them, but there's a whole area within the North Sea that's dedicated to development. So there is sort of further potential to carry out or gather data. And if I go one slide back, um, there have been, apart from the EIA data gathering that we do, there's also regional studies, and these are generally sort of collaborative projects um, where it's, it's just studies that are carried out. Um, to also for sort of inform ourselves about the uh, archaeology assets that are out there um, on the water, basically. And uh, studies such as the North Sea Pali Landscape Project, which um, is the hatched area. Um, and there's also uh, strategic environment assessment areas and regional environmental characterization projects. So apart from the EIA gathering, there's also um, other studies that are being carried out. And this um, leads on to the methods that we use to sort of gather this, this information, and that will be this one. Okay. Right, so yeah, as Steph said, I'll, uh, I'll talk through basically a few of the methodologies that we use in uh, offshore uh, survey, geophysics and geotechnics for archaeology, uh, and then I'll get on to kind of some more about the, uh, the big data uh, part of things. So I've got this uh, nice flow diagram up there, which is probably one of the simplest flow diagrams I've ever seen. Apart from do I want to have a drink? Um, but this basically is a you know an idea of what it is that we do. So at the, the top here we have all the various bits of data that are collected in the first instance. So you've got the remote sensing, which is basically the geophysical data. Then you've got the ground truthing, which can be either geotechnical ground truthing in the, uh, like balls, cores, grab samples, that kind of thing, or it can be ground truthing by diver observation of things at the seabed or ROV observations. And then you've got the existing data in the search, which can be previous projects in the areas, or it can be uh, like the UKHO, the Hydrographic Office, um, of their uh, chartered wrecks and uh, kind of information that's from the, the areas. Uh, so basically, take all this information together, then integrate everything, cross correlate between the different data sets to then put either a model output, which can be done in the case of shallow geology or uh, a distribution of uh, features which may be of archaeological potential for uh, things that are actually on the seabed. So, different types of data collected, I've just basically um, touched on those slightly. So, marine geophysical surveys, marine geotechnical surveys, the visual inspection data, the historic records, 
And from our point of view, this is usually third-party data. So for this, uh, in the case of the offshore wind farms and the infrastructure projects, the surveys are actually undertaken not from an archaeological perspective, but they're undertaken for the engineering for these sites. And then we acquire that data uh, to then undertake an archaeological assessment. We also uh, look at uh, free data, freely available data on online portals, such as the uh, UKHO, which have uh, multiple bathymetry data for large areas of the seabed, and also the BGS, uh, which have backscatter data and uh, geological information there as well. And just an idea of the scale of some of the data we're talking about, this is a nice plot of every currently known and charted shipwreck around the UK waters, and we're seeing there's quite a few. Uh, so, for looking at objects in the seabed, for any of you who don't really know much about marine survey or about marine surveying, anything like this, let's give you a quick run through of the main techniques that we use. Uh, on the left here, you've got the side scan sonar, which is down here, it's still behind the vessel, it's very torpedo shaped, about this kind of size. Um, it has transducers on the side, it's an acoustic technique, and basically pings out sound waves either side of the fish, and you get what is almost like a aerial photograph in sound of the seabed beneath the fish. So this is where the fish would travel, that's the seabed, and then you're it's going outwards you've got a nice, it looks like half a wreck there on the this channel of the data. We also have marine magnetometer data, which again, another torpedo shaped bit of kit that's towed down the vessel, um, and that detects magnetic anomalies in a similar way that magnetic does uh, on land. Uh, so the, the larger uh, a lump of iron, ferrous or steel, uh, the larger the magnetic anomaly you get. Um, and so this is a gridded uh, bit of data from magnetometers. The blue lines are the individual um, yeah, the individual tracks where the vessel's gone up and down, and then you see we've got some anomalies which may or may not be of potential different ones that we to find down there that have come up in the data. And then the third method for the seabed data is multi-beam bathymetry. It's again, it's an acoustic technique. It's a little bit similar in how it works to the side scan sonar, in that it's a piece of equipment, it's underneath the boat, it fires out sound waves, but instead of this kind of response, what it does is it collects the depth. Uh, of each of the, um, the soundings, and you get uh, 3D model information. You can create 3D models from the information actually of the bathymetry. So, this is an example of the data there, and a nice shipwreck and some scar on the side at the bottom. Uh, so, what kind of features are we actually looking for on the seabed? Shipwrecks, that's the obvious one. These are the multi beam bathymetry images, uh, some nice 3D. 3D data of a shipwreck that I think that's the Anglia. And then this one is a submarine wreck off the south coast. That's the, the A1. There's now a nice dive trail around the, uh, the A1 if you like um, And then we have the South Scan Sonar data. Again, we have another wreck here, that's slightly uh, it's another shipwreck, that's slightly degraded. This one is not a ship. This one is actually a uh, it's a, a German aircraft, the Dornier, which was found on the Goodman Sands and um, is in fantastic condition for an aircraft wreck and that was actually raised <coughs> and is in the process of kind of being conserved. Um, but it's not just these wreck sites that we're actually looking for, we can also do things around the coast such as for old coastal defences, old coastal structures such as piers, that kind of thing. Uh, isolator finds, you'd be amazed how many random anchors are just left lying around the seabed or individual cannons. Um, drowned settlements. So off the east coast, you get places such as Dunwich. Uh, you still have like significant bits of masonry left from kind of the churches of the town, which you can actually see on the data. Um, but basically, we are looking for anything that's kind of anthropogenic. Uh, sometimes in the data, it's a little difficult to tell more than that from the actual data itself. So we can identify anomalies that don't appear to be natural, but they could be archaeology, they could be modern features. So we're not entirely sure on that, but we highlight what these features are for potential future investigations. And it's not always about what's on the seabed, we also look beneath the seabed uh, using sub bottom profilers. Now, I, I assume that most people have heard of the Dogger Land, which is an amazing word that sounds like a theme park. Uh, but basically, in certain periods of time over the last million years, the North Sea has been dry land. Um, uh, and on that dry land, we have a lot of evidence for uh, humans living in the landscape. Uh, as well as uh, like prehistoric faunal rem remains. Um, so what we do is we try to use the sub-bottom profiler 
So yeah. identify buried uh, terrestrial features to then try and reconstruct what the landscape looked like at different periods of time. Uh, and there are a whole suite of different sub-bottom profiles um, with fantastically imaginative names. The boomer, which booms, you know, a king that pings. There are also sparkers that spark. Um, the chirp, I don't think the actual chirps, but you know. Uh, and these are all uh, different frequencies. So this is a, a boomer catamaran, so that kind of floats just on top of the uh, seabed there. That's kind of a mid-range, mid-power piece of equipment. While this is the chirp, which is towed usually a bit lower. That's a much higher resolution bit of equipment, but you don't penetrate as much into the seabed with that. So it does depend on what you're expecting in the area as to what kind of uh, the trade-off between resolution and depth penetration in other different areas. So just a couple of examples. So in this, this is the water column. Uh, that's the seabed, so it's essentially just a slice through the seabed using seismic data. We've got a nice payload channel feature here with a, what is a peat? A PC land surface on top, which is a very nice, simple feature. It's nice to interpret that kind of thing. It can also be a lot more complicated, such as this. A whole series of cross cutting channels. But some of these could be potentially archaeologically important. So this particular, uh, uh, this particular unit here is part of what's known as the Yarmouth Roads Formation. And that's actually the offshore equivalent of um, the, uh, uh, the the sediments onshore where they found kind of Haysborough and Pakefield. So what I'll do, since I'm starting to run out of time slightly, I'll skip on to the data volumes bit. Now you know the, uh, the basics of these things. So, uh, move towards larger sites offshore has resulted in a massive amount of data being produced, an increasing amount of data. So these are the different rounds of wind farms that are, have been uh, created offshore over the years. Uh, much larger areas. Um, the data volume that we get from these uh, uh, from these sites are now huge. We're getting terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data from each individual site, where before it was taking people days to interpret. Now it can take months or years sometimes. The same with data resolution. Uh, the resolution is going up and up and up as they go from the original wide area scoping down to the much narrow focus, um, uh, narrow focus uh, uh, surveys for pre-construction. Especially with the multi beam, when we're now um, doing the seabed at a resolution of like 25 centimeters over areas that can be kilometers squared, and these are huge data sets that we need to deal with. So, a couple more problems and solutions. So, yeah, problems with data transmittal very large hard drives, file transfer sites, but that depends on your network speed, that causes issues. Your data storage, we're now having to get dedicated data services, servers just to hold this information because the rest of the servers that we use are just not big enough and, and they can't cope with the amount of data that we're getting in. Data tracking, we now don't get sites uh, all at once. We get to the end, yeah, these are delivered in blocks, uh, so they split the area into small sections and then it gets delivered in blocks. We need to track all that data as it actually comes in. Um, computer hardware is a big one. Um, it's more like running to keep up with the amount of data and the amount of software that's available just to kind of run to keep up with the um, specifications of the, um, the actual data itself. And then we have increased staff capacity time just because of you know, the amount of data and then the delivery schedules which we need good client communication with because if you're getting blocks of data at a time you can't then just have one, uh, uh, one report at the end. They want individual reports for individual areas. Um, uh, as they go along their process, so they can design their uh, they can design their areas. Um, so oh, you can have that one. Go on. Oh, sweet. Right. So, um, as you can see, there's a large amount of data, and you can't possibly present these, especially when you come to writing out an impact assessment. So we try and present it in a way that's sort of easy to read, and you know, you don't just give a bulk of information to someone who can't understand that. So um, these are presented within the EIA, and very often you obviously have to recommend medication for those assets that have high potential or of, are of significance. Um, and then these would be obviously put in place during the construction phase of the wind farm. Um, so for the case of um, uh, seabed prehistory, you would tend to go for more visuals, so you'd present plans um, of the area being studied and then you'd mark out those areas um, of, of potential, um, so the, the areas of interest, features of interest. 
Um, you'd also present a sort of gazetteer, so you list down all the features and then these, this would give information that, like you ID it, um, you sort of give an archaeological discrimination, whether it's of high potential or not. Um, you'd give uh, dimensions, so it's a, it's a more readable format. Um, and you also produce or you provide recommendations. And similarly, for the for uh, anomalies, geophysical anomalies, um, you get something similar. You get also maps uh, pinpointing the sort of the features that we've uh, identified in the geophysical surveys. Um, you also give an, uh, an archaeological discrimination, so you give them different um, sort of readings, whether they're of anthropogenic origin or not, whether you can actually identify them or not. And again, you'd, you'd produce a gazetteer, so you list down all the features. And very often, um, this would also incorporate data sets from the UKHO, because very often the UKHO would actually have, uh, you, you'd be able to identify those features. Um, but sometimes you might not be able to collaborate the two, so you produce sort of something else which would be um, related to the historic records. So you'd get um, sort of records that are maritime losses where you don't actually have a specific GPS position for them. And similarly, you present that as a, as a gazetteer where you've got a description of the asset and like that you can uh, provide a sort of potential, further potential for the area for further um, well, maritime or aviation assets within the area. Um, and this would also incorporate um, local historic environment records so you take different data sets and just combine them together into one gazetteer um, with regards to the mitigation recommendations that are presented as part of the assessment uh, very often we'd go for um, in situ preservation obviously that's the sort of more cost efficient method um, and like that you'd put in or implement um, an archaeological exclusion zone, so it's like a buffer around that asset and like that you'd completely avoid obviously you know, passing through it or constructing a turbine on it. Um, but sometimes you might, that might not be the case, so you might want to um, carry out further investigations. So for something like submerged prehistory, you might want to take further geotechnical samples and like that you can clearly sort of identify whether there's real potential or not. Um, or for anomalies, you might go down with um, um, remotely operated vehicles and actually um, identify whether that's an archaeological feature or not. Um, and very often these are addressed in a written scheme of investigation, that's a WSI, where this also implements or recommends or puts in place a protocol, a protocol for archaeological discoveries. Um, so basically, if in these large scale development projects, you can't very often have an archaeologist on site. So what you do is train up the crew um, and in case there's a, an archaeological discovery whilst they're constructing or dredging, then um, they'll be able to sort of um, inform the authorities and be able to sort of um, identify or record that um, feature that they found. Um, and there are two well, documents that have been published. One is the Protocol for Archaeological Discoveries, which are mostly, is mostly used for wind farms. But then there's also another protocol used for the aggregate dredging. So they're, they're slightly different, but they, they deal it with the same, they deal it in the same manner. Um, and obviously, with all this data gathering, um, you need to archive it. We, we do that internally, but also um, archiving it w within the state. So you'd use something in Scotland, the OASIS um, archive, plus publishing it. So it would also sort of add to the knowledge pool of the regional studies that have already been carried out. Um, and that's basically it. Thank you.